Welcome back everybody to another reaction video. Well, with uh, Christmas almost upon us, I thought it would be a good time to dive a little deeper into the story of the World War I Christmas Truce. We're going to take a look at this two-part series uh, from Extra History on the World War I Christmas Truce. We did watch uh, and talk a little bit about this a few weeks ago when Sabaton's song Christmas Truce came out. I'll put a link in the description if you want to see that reaction when that song first came out. We talked a little bit about this, but we're going to get a little more in depth now. Uh, by taking a look at this as always the link is in the description to the original content please give them a like and subscribe if you haven't already let's go ahead and dive into this christmas eve 1914 the war was supposed to be over by now This little holiday special is brought to you by World of Tanks. Use the invite code ARMISTICE if you're a new player who wants to check out the game. So he made a good point there at the beginning by saying the war was supposed to be over by now. Everybody thought it would be a really quick war, like a couple of weeks. I shouldn't say everybody. There are always people who know the reality of things. But by and large, that's what a lot of people thought. There'll be a couple of quick battles. It'll be decisive, especially on the German side. They thought they'd march on Paris in a few weeks and that would be it. That they might have to deal with the Russians a little bit longer, but nobody thought the Western Front War was going to last this long. And that seems to be the case with a lot of wars. People think they're going to be over a lot quicker than they end up being. The Christmas Truce is one of the most poignant events of the First World War. A time when men rose up above the madness of the conflict and, for just a moment, saw each other as fellow humans. This is an event that definitely did happen. Thousands of men laid down arms in the truce, but a century of retellings has also kind of sanded down its rough edges and oversimplified its messy reality. And that always happened. That's why it's so important that we go back to the original sources. Uh, and I talk about this all the time. Whenever we're looking at sources, we need to consider, first of all, are they eyewitnesses? And if they are eyewitnesses, what's their slant? What's their agenda? What is their bias? And, you know, look at that through that. So, you know, I talk about this example all the time. Julius Caesar is an eyewitness who wrote about things that happened, but he also was telling his side of the story, and he definitely had an agenda, which was to make himself look good uh, and to make his enemy appear more powerful and more ruthless than they really probably were. Uh, so the same thing here. The nice thing here is that we have sources on both sides and we have sources on the ground. We have letters, hundreds of letters written by Germans, written by the French, written, written by the British who were there, who experienced this. And we can put all of that together and between all of those sources, get a pretty accurate picture of what actually happened. Indeed, this event wasn't just the result of pure human spirit and holiday cheer. It was a host of unique factors that drove these enemies to spontaneously declare peace in no man's land. And really, it may not have been all that spontaneous. Small armistices were happening every day. As frontline troops became accustomed to the rhythms of trench warfare, they learned that looking the other way now and then could bring a shred of safety and calm to their lives. The armies ate meals at the same time, which became a daily ceasefire. Patrols frequently ignored each other, adopting a live and let live attitude. Yeah, if I don't shoot at you and you don't shoot at me and we both have a chance to get out of this alive, all for it, right? I mean, and this is one of the big issues that you're going to have between the commanders, the officers, and the enlisted men. Enlisted men, they're just trying to get home alive. They just want to survive. They're not worried about taking the next trench. They're not worried about pushing the front line a couple hundred yards forward. That's the problem for the officers, for the generals back at headquarters who aren't on the front lines. And that's why this truce happens in part because there is that difference between what the officers want, what the leaders want, and what happens on the front lines. And it's also why it probably never happens again. Troops often shouted to each other across the lines. After all, the autumn battles had passed, and both sides were waiting out the winter. In reality, the weather was the primary enemy for both sides. The high water table at Flanders meant that the trenches were always filling with water, sometimes collapsing and burying men inside. Soldiers leaned against the walls to sleep, trying to keep themselves out of the wet. Food supplies had to be hung up on dugout ceilings. 
And that winter had been particularly miserable. Weeks of rain flooded the dugouts. The mud pulled men down like quicksand. Now, British Field Marshal Sir John French had noticed the hands-off attitude his men were developing towards the enemy, and so he ordered attacks in late December to boost morale. And Think about that. Ordering attacks to boost morale. Whose morale are you boosting? These guys are just trying to stay alive. The last thing they want is to not only have to survive all this stuff, but now have to go out and fight when all they want to do is be home with their families for Christmas. Uh, so he's thinking more in terms of keeping these guys fighting edge up. I don't know if morale is the word I would use for it. And this resulted in heavy British losses. Concerned about possible fraternization over the holiday, he issued orders that no unofficial armistice would be tolerated. Morale was much better over in the German trenches. After all, they were winning. But many men were also experiencing their first holiday away from home. Knowing that this would be difficult, commanders brought Christmas to the trenches, shipping thousands of presents to the field. Each man received a gift from the Kaiser. Cigar boxes... Now, <laughs> I have to admit, we did watch this video, uh, at least this first one, uh, during a live stream we did a couple weeks ago and people were just throwing out suggestions. So I've seen this one before. Uh, so it's not quite the same reaction I got the first time when I saw what they were being sent, but this is pretty awesome what they're being sent. This is for NCOs, a pipe with the crown prince on it for the ranks. <laughs> Here's a bunch of cigars. What if you don't smoke? I guess you do smoke. The Kaiser sent you stuff. You're going to smoke. And a pipe with the crown prince's face on it. I love that. The crown prince um, was one of the uh, commanders on the ground. In fact, I, f I think he was one of the leading uh, German commanders over in the area around Ypres. And f I want to say he was in command of one of the first gas attacks. The British, for their part, received a brass box from Princess Mary filled with cigarettes, tobacco, a Christmas card, and sweets. And then there were personal packages. Enterprises sprang up on the home front, offering family members a chance to send gift boxes to the troops. British soldiers received plum puddings and thousand-count boxes of cigarettes. Thousand-count boxes of cigarettes. Again, great unless you don't smoke, but I guess you could probably trade it for something. Um fascinating stuff. German and Austrian troops were bombarded with chocolate and salami and cognac. I guess Both you said what you have. received winter clothing. In truth, though, the gifts were kind of a nuisance. I mean, there was nowhere to put it all. Soldiers didn't have a place to store a thousand extra cigarettes. But that Christmas Eve delivered a true gift. The rain stopped and the trenches drained. Dry cold froze the mud into a hard surface, almost like a floor. Snow dusted the countryside. That afternoon, the gunfire dwindled, and in some sectors it stopped entirely. The weather just seemed too nice for it. The Germans, stuffed with Christmas chocolate and cheered by the weather, started putting lit Tannenbaum up on their trench parapets. And then, the German line started singing. Over on the British parapets, watchmen of the Scots Guard saw lines of lights along the enemy trench. And the Germans, by all accounts, uh, the song that everybody remembers hearing them sing was Stille Nacht, which is a Silent Night. It was written in German originally. Um, so it, it's definitely a song that would have been very familiar to the Germans, and the tune would have obviously been familiar uh, to the British as well. At first, they suspected an attack. But then, they heard an ethereal sound drifting across no man's land. Stille Nacht, Heilige Nacht. The original Austrian version of Silent Night. Sensing a challenge, Guards Officer Lieutenant Sir Edward Hulse decided that they should drown this out with their own carol. The sides went back and forth, Love it. but soon, the competition merged into a harmony of Good King Wenceslas and Old Lang Syne. The men began shouting Christmas greetings across the line, jokingly, at first. A few even stepped out to talk. Hulse didn't know it, but the same thing was happening up and down the entire British line. See, none of this was ordered. In fact, it was ordered against uh, for it to happen. But what are you going to do? I mean, if you're a lieutenant or a captain on the line and you see this happening, what are you going to do? You're not going to stop it. You're not going to going to keep these men from having this moment. Uh, they all needed this 
desperately needed this. I mean, we can't even begin to imagine. Uh, and this is still just the first months of the war. I mean, so it's only going to get worse. This is before the Somme. This is before Verdun. This is before some of the worst uh, death and destruction that's going to happen on the Western Front. Uh, but it's already been ugly. It's already been brutal. Agreements formed. In some sectors, the officers met at the wire and shook hands, agreeing to cease hostilities the next day. In other areas, the ranks took the lead. Germans shouting across no man's land, English, tomorrow if you no shoot, we no shoot. At times, it was just one brave soul walking into no man's land, waving a newspaper. These overtures were extremely dangerous. Though yeah. peace was breaking out in certain areas, it didn't happen everywhere. It's dangerous for a number of reasons. Number one, the first guy that pops his head up is liable to get shot before he even has a chance to say, hey, I'm not trying to shoot. Um, you know, before they even can tell that you don't have a weapon in your hand. Um, I, I don't know of any stories of that happening, though. I think everybody was pretty content to let this go. Um, you also have to worry about your own officers being pretty upset with you and punishing you for it. One British regiment responded to German caroling with a machine gun blast. Some unarmed soldiers were gunned down trying to broker this holiday armistice. So it did armistice. happen, okay. But in most sectors, the ceasefire held. This truce mostly happened between German and British units. The French and the Belgians, whose countries were under German occupation, were less inclined. This makes total sense, and you see the same kind of thing in World War II. Um, the British and the Americans tended to get along better with the Germans than the Germans did with the French or with the, the Russians for obvious reasons. The Germans had conquered their countries. They had done some pretty awful things, and especially the Belgians. What the Belgian uh, civilians had experienced at the hands of the Germans in World War I, there was no love lost at all between them, and it's totally understandable why this would not have been a more common thing. But with the British, a little different. There were agreements to bury the dead and cease hostilities, but not as much fraternization. Yet, a Bavarian unit held fire during a French mass, and both sides halted fighting long enough for a guest, a soloist from the Paris Opera, to make a performance. British Indian troops, who were a bit unfamiliar with this whole Christmas deal, saw the lit German trees and thought of their own holiday of Diwali. They held fire, but also held position, until some Germans tempted them out of the trenches with cigars and cigarettes. Which they had plenty of, you know. Soon the men were smoking together on the parapet. That Christmas night, the troops slept in sublime quiet. Christmas Day dawned, bright and cold, the sky clear for the first time in weeks. To their shock, British troops looked across no man's land to see the Germans walking around on their parapets. Such a thing was suicidal in daylight, yeah. and that gesture of trust, more than anything, lured a few British out. It was heaven to at last stand up straight and walk on solid earth. Some had ventured into no man's land on Christmas Eve, but in daylight, it was impossible to ignore the bodies lying between the trenches. I was going to say, uh, this had to have been tough, especially if you had buddies that were still laying out there. Because remember, this is not like um, all of your men were killed in the trenches where you can bury them and, and you know take care of them. A lot of them, if there was an assault and then you fell back, they were left out there. And that's why we see so many unknowns everywhere. Because a lot of these bodies were just left where they died for months sometimes if there couldn't be a, a, a truce or a ceasefire to make that happen. So uh, you have to deal with that first before you can do anything else. The two sides buried their dead in common graves, grieving side by side mm -hmm. in joint services, listening to the faraway sounds of battle from other sectors. And that shared experience broke down the wall. Soldiers milled about together in no man's land. This is, you know, the shared experience thing can't be overlooked because, you know, a lot of these guys, as much as they want to be back home, people back home couldn't possibly understand what they've been through. Even when the war's over and they go back, they don't have the first clue what you experience. That's something that only you and the guy next to you can experience. But that guy in the trench across from you also understood what that was like. You had more in common in a lot of ways, you know, as a British soldier, you had more in common with that German guy in the trench across from you than you did with your family back home at this point. Swapping over abundant gifts from home. British beef for uniform buttons. Chocolate cake for barrels of beer. They exchanged hats. One German barber gave haircuts. 
The men chatted. After all, they shared so much in common. They lived in the same fields under the same rain, and they were equally sick of war. Besides, they were curious. What was life like on the other side? Who were these enemies? One British officer was perplexed to learn that his new German friend believed the armies of the Kaiser fought for freedom. That was impossible, the officer responded. We're fighting for freedom. Amid this, Lieutenant Hulse found himself talking to Lieutenant Thomas of the 15th Westphalians, who had something to pass on. A Victoria Cross and mm. a packet of letters. An English officer had died in the German trench during the last attack. Perhaps he could give these to the man's family? So, a lot to unpack there. First of all, um, the revelation that other people are fighting for something that you think you're fighting for. And it's that eye-opening example of, wow, we both think we're fighting for the same thing. Now, we're not, but we both think that way. We both feel that way. We've both been sold that this war is the same thing. Uh, and it's just that reminder that uh, what a government is hoping to achieve through war is not necessarily what the guy on the ground thinks he's doing or what he signed up for or what he's fighting for. Uh, and especially once you start dealing with drafts and, and when you don't have necessarily all volunteers, they're, they're fighting for the guy next to them. They're fighting to get home alive. They're not fighting for any great, uh, you know, some great thing beyond that. Uh, and I love little stories like this where these guys, there's a lot of examples of respect like this being shown to the enemy. Uh, this guy got a Victoria Cross, which... Um, for American audience and others, Victoria Cross is basically the British Empire's version of the Medal of Honor. Um, and uh, this guy had one that he'd obviously received probably either very early in the war or even in a previous action uh, in another war, maybe in Africa or something. And um, They wanted to get it back to him along with the letters, uh, get it back to their lines. And that was a, a great gesture. And you see things like this, like when Quentin Roosevelt gets shot down uh, and the Germans uh, bury him with military honors, or when the Red Baron is shot down, uh, same thing. Touched, Hulse removed his own silk scarf, a gift from home, and presented it in thanks. Thomas, embarrassed that he had nothing to give in return, sent a soldier to fetch the fur gloves that his family had sent. Up and down the line, men started bringing out footballs. Kickabouts broke out, with men from both sides chasing the ball among shell holes and sliding on the frozen ground. And this is one of those things that some people try to claim, well, we don't really know if it happened. Absolutely did. We have dozens and dozens of letters home on both sides that not only describe there being football kickabouts and things like that, but actual organized matches in some places, even with scores. People telling us in some places where the British won, some places where the Germans won, uh, even telling us details about the, the matches. In one sector, a group of Highlanders challenged a Saxon regiment, who burst out laughing whenever a kilt flew up during play. But not all of this activity was goodwill. On both sides, a few used the gatherings to reconnoiter enemy trenches. And, and this kind sides... of thing happened in all other wars as well. I talked about this in my series down in Vicksburg, where they had a truce uh, in late May of 1863 to come out and bury the dead between the lines. And some of the Union officers used this as an opportunity to get close to the Confederate uh, trenches to kind of check things out and see what they could learn. ...used the time to repair dugouts. Of course, for some, this fraternization appeared false. One British soldier flashed his squad mate a hidden dagger, while another refused to smoke German cigarettes, fearing that they might be poisoned. When one squad of Bavarians discussed whether to meet the British, their corporal snapped at them. Hitler. Such a thing should not happen in wartime. Have you no German sense of honor left at all? Yeah, and he. this is well known that he was not a fan of the Christmas truce. They weren't surprised. The night before, the same soldier had refused to join the unit's Christmas service. Corporal Hitler was odd like that. But his disapproval reflected the general's view. This was exactly the situation that Field Marshal French had feared. Commanders dispatched senior officers to threaten disciplinary action and insist that the men restart the war. You can understand both sides of this. You can understand stand the men on the ground wanting to do this. You can also understand why the higher command understood what a problem it was. 
how do you shoot at a guy that you were just playing football with earlier, that you were just singing Christmas carols with? Now you got to go back tomorrow and start shooting at him again. A lot of these guys had to be rotated off the front lines because they just weren't willing. We already know that men in general avoid shooting at each other. We've, I've talked about this in the past where they've done studies and the vast majority of men on the front lines do not aim at a person when they're firing. They'll fire in that direction, but they're... You know, people are just by nature don't want to kill people. That's why you see certain officers describing some men in their ranks as killers. Those are the guys you knew would shoot at the enemy when needed. But most people weren't like that. In some sectors, the armistice came to an orderly close. Officers from both sides saluted and fired revolvers into the air, signaling that, all right, the war was back on. Mm. In a few places, troops resisted until nearly to New Year's Eve. But Impressive. the generals would not have it. German command dispatched snipers to break the ceasefire. French ordered an artillery barrage, letting the machinery of war roll over the human connections of the frontline troops. Nothing like this Christmas truce would happen again. Nope. The generals wouldn't allow it. On Christmas Eve 1915, British officers ordered a 24-hour artillery barrage. You can understand why that was necessary and how they're already thinking ahead. We can't let this happen again. So planning an artillery barrage to go for 24 hours is probably the best way to keep it from happening again. Men who tried to form a truce were court-martialed. Machine guns drowned out German carols. But the generals needn't have bothered. The spirit of that truce was unique to 1914, a symptom of a young war. Yeah. By Christmas 1915, those troops had experienced chlorine gas and creeping bombardments. Zeppelins were bombing London. The Battle of Verdun would end just before the holiday, leaving 750,000 casualties. Indeed, many of the men who celebrated in no man's land that day would never see another Christmas. One of those unlucky ones was Lieutenant Sir Edward Hulse, who had sung carols and given a German officer his silk scarf. He died three months later while trying to save a wounded comrade. He was 25. And yet, Hulse is not remembered today for his military achievements, or even the book of letters that his friends published after his death. He and so many others are remembered for a victory entirely their own when a group of brave men ventured into the line of fire, trusting their enemies not to shoot, and believing that humanity was better than the bonfire it had built for itself. Happy holidays, everybody. Yeah, and you know, we say it all the time, but war, and not just war, but any stressful, difficult, tragic situation, September 11th, a school shooting, things like that, it brings out the best in some people and it brings out the worst in other people. And we see the example of it bringing out the best in some people here. People uh, hanging on to their humanity in the midst of a war that requires them to be inhuman as often as possible. It's, a, it's such a weird thing, uh, war. Uh, and, and yet I think that's why we're so drawn to those stories is because of the humanity that we find in the midst of the worst of situations. Uh, I believe the second part of this is actually looking specifically at some of the letters, which are fascinating to read. I've read some of them, uh, the letters that people wrote home about those experiences, and it brings it home a little more. So we'll take a look at that tomorrow. Uh, like I said, I'll put the link in the description to my reaction to Sabaton's Christmas Truce, which is a fantastic song. Uh, check that out check out the original content as well. Uh, and uh, as he said, happy holidays to you, whatever it is that you might celebrate, whether it's Christmas uh, or any other holiday or no holiday at all. Uh, just I hope you guys have a fantastic uh, few days ahead. Stay healthy, stay safe, uh, and uh, be good to one another. Take care. We'll see you again soon.